I'm Cosimo, Solution Architect here at Algorand Inc. And today we are going to uh, have a journey into the Algorand working principle. So the presentation is a compressed version of the Algorand School, which is an open source uh, deck that I encourage you to download and read. Uh, it's an overview of the, the Algorand technology, uh, an introductory step to learn how Algorand works. So today I reshaped the presentation and I call the presentation Algorand Efficiency. And you are going to understand why in a minute. So everything is, uh, you can find the, the fully flesh version on, on GitHub and you have the reference there. Okay. So our journey today is understanding Algorand working principle to be able to answer the following question that is, is Algorand efficient? So let me just start with an example. So I am an electrical engineer and I think that right questions are relevant, more relevant than the right answer. So here's you have an electric motor, which is a machine that takes some power, electrical power as an input, applies some electromechanical conversion following the law of physics and output useful mechanical power. So a good question is, is this machine efficient? But a better question is, is this machine efficient at consuming the input resources to produce the desired output for which it has been designed for? And I would like to apply the same uh, question to our technology. So Algorand, uh, by the way, for electric models, this is true. This is a very efficient machine. Um, and working principle are due to Galileo Ferraris in 1885 and follow the law of physics. We are trying to uh, understand what are the laws of Algorand. So first of all, we should see a blockchain as an infrastructure for digital native value. And I would like to quote here Eric Smith that says that the ability to create something which is not duplicable in the digital world has an enormous power, an enormous value. And blockchain is that kind of thing. So it's an infrastructure for digital value. And like all the infrastructure, we have to reason as a system with uh, some questions. So we can find a trilemma in infrastructure, which is a trilemma that says, could add an infrastructure be at the same time secure, accessible, and efficient? So for example, if we speak about roads, I would like to be in a road which is secure, so the bridge don't fall down when I'm on it and people that are driving on the infrastructure are not driving like crazy. So it's secure in an internal perspective and extrinsic, extrinsic per perspective. Is that accessible? So it, there is someone who controls the infrastructure that can shut off the, the infrastructure uh, because this is not a, a, a private property, it's an infrastructure, so it should be accessible to everyone. Is that efficient? So an electrical grid, a network, is efficient in distributing power without consuming so much power. So this is a trilemma. And since the blockchain is an infrastructure, we will have another kind of trilemma. So the problem of the native digital value is that in the digital, in the digital age, everything can be represented in bits, so a string of zero, one. And such strings are very useful because you can duplicate them as you like. So value is therefore very difficult to represent in the digital age because we need scarcity, authenticity, and 
unicity over this digital thing. And how to build such an infrastructure? And the answer is within a pro we need a protocol. So just like the TCPIP is a foundational protocol that works good for communication, we will figure out a protocol that works better, not, not just for transferring information, but transferring value. But this is not just an information technology problem, because distributed system cryptography and game theory are the element that solves this problem and together creates this infrastructure. First one, distributed system and cryptography could solve information problem, but we need game theory and plug game theory into the game, so into the, the infrastructure, to obtain what? To obtain what we call a public, tamper-proof, transparent, and trustless ledger, which is what we want. And we are going to understand why in a minute. So I would like to reason about blockchain as a way to introduce analog properties into digital things. And I would like to speak about a new kind of law, which is not a law of physics, but it's a consensus law, which is a law of physics for the digital world. And we are going to understand why. Uh, so notice that the, the path until today was trying to transform the analog world and digitalize it. But now we have a native digital problem for which the analog is the answer. Okay? So first of all, this ledger is what we call a blockchain, is a public ledger or infra of transactional data and solves the problem that we are trying to solve. So records who owns what. And this was the mission of the writing system since the beginning of the humankind. So one first application of the writing system was tracking what is mine and what is yours. And this is exactly what we are trying to accomplish here. So this is a, an historical example how, on how things work in the past. But since this ledger is very important and tracks a really important truth, we would like to replicate this ledger because more copies are better than one. So uh, what we end up obtaining is a distributed and replicated ledger across a system of multiple nodes. And all those ledger keepers should work together following the same set of rules to verify what we are going to write into this ledger. And am I allowed to write this? Am I allowed to spare, spread this word into the system? So now, why I, I would like to talk about entropy, irreversibility, and the arrow of time? Because like I said, bits, can be copy and paste and are not obliged to follow the arrow of time, which is an ultimately thermodynamical concept that tracks the direction of time. Because if you take a system in a state A, put it in, the system, in, in a state B, and then you come back to system A, you are not sure and you are no thing that say that the second A state comes before, uh, after the first one. So it's really hard in the digital world to follow a unique direction of time. And this is not true for the atoms, because for the atoms, which are ultimately an analog thing, you cannot copy and paste atoms as you like, and they are obliged 
to follow the arrow of time because there is the law of physics which is inviolable so we would like to take this property here of the physical world and plug into the digital realm this is why we end up organizing the things as a chain of transaction organized in block because of the block the concept of block refers to the set of transactions that are proposed and verified by the other nodes and eventually end up being added into the finalized ledger. So there is no arbitrary copy and paste. There is no possibility to remove information as you like or add information as you like. You have a rule. And the chain refers to the fact that each block contains a proof, so a cryptographical hash of what is in the previous block, and these enforce an arrow of time. So these enforce on this system a consequential, an, histor an historical hierarchy. So here on the right, you have a machine, which is ultimately analog. And we we can think of a, a machine like a system described by the evolution of states. So in this case, the system is very simple because it's described by two states, two state variables, which are pressure and volume. And here we have an evolution of a system that is determined by something that acts on the atoms through the law of physics. Okay? So we end up consuming some input power to obtain useful work. On the other hand, we have another system that is characterized by states. And this, this system can evolve, can evolve over time. How evolves? So the evolution, how the evolution is determined? What, what, what is acting on those bits to evolve the state of the system. This law is what we call consensus protocol. So here you have the photo of Margaret Hamilton, which is maybe the woman that defined the concept of what is software engineering. So what you have here is the actual source code of the Apollo mission. So here, this is the source code. So it's a paleo computing where no IDE, no syntax highlighting, everything was handwritten. And this woman has a huge responsibility, which is adding a new piece of information that is very, very, very important to the whole system. Okay, so if the question is how should we replace the role played by the low facing uh, in the digital realm, the answer is with a set of rules that we call consensus protocol that enforce the rules of the evolving system. So we can think of it like a blockchain in which each piece of information is contained in the block. And Margaret Hamilton has a block proposer which has the duty to add a consistent information. But who elects Margaret Hamilton? Who chooses the fact that she is entitled to do that? So here you have an image, which is the uh, Tempio della Concordia, Temple uh, of Concordia. Um, it is the largest, maybe best preserved Doric temple in Sicily. And has been entitled to the goddess of Concordia, which is the goddess that protects the social harmony. Okay? So this is a power, powerful symbol because we need to have an harmony in the system and we have to come up with an agreement, so a consensus that says how should how to choose the 
proposal for the next block. So why someone says, okay, it's Har Margaret Hamilton or it's Cosimo in a way that is public and permissionless? Uh, how to ensure that there is no ambiguity between two blocks proposed at the same time? So we have a unique answer to this question and that you ultimately answer also to the fact that how to ensure that blockchain stays unique and we have no branches in the technology. And also, since the, this is a law, how should we use this law to evolve itself so that this system is evolvable over time? So the first answer when this technology came up was the proof of work answer, and which is not sustainable because miners uh, compete with each other to append an S block and earn an award for that, fighting this very, very expensive computational battle. And the more computational power you have, the higher the probability that you end up being elected to propose this block. But this is very wasteful because this needs huge electrical consumption and end up being very concentrated. So this concentrates the governance of the system in few mining farms. And also it's not resilient with respect to soft forking, which is something that we ultimately don't want. So what was the other answer historically is, okay, to elect, to, to take the game theory into place and let people that have skin in the game participate in the, in the process, we should rely on those people that show something which in, is important to them. It is the real value that they own on the ledger. So the network participation in the proof of stake uh, require a commitment and an interest in keeping this ledger safe, uh, providing the proof of ownership of a value that is stored on the infrastructure. And the higher is the skin in the game, the higher probability you have to being elected as a block proposer. But historically, there were two forms of proof of stake with some limitation. So, for example, the first one, which is the bonded proof of stake, requires two validators behind their stake to show a commitment in validating a, a block by bonding it, their value. The problem is that this participation has some risk of economical buyer, barrier to the entrancy and makes those value not liquid. The other proposal was, okay, uh, let's try to delegate the vote of minor uh, stakers to someone that could speak on their behalf, on their behalf. And the delegated validation uh, end up being another uh, answer to the problem of electing people, but this has some concern and some problem, which is, is centralized by design, and since you have known delegated, it's very easy to attack them with denial of service. It's like playing battlesh battleship in which you know in advance the coordinate of your adversary. So you can very easily target it. And that's why we end up being here today to discuss the Algorand consensus, which is the consensus that solves a trilemma for an infrastructure which is ultimately the blockchain infrastructure. And if you replace those concepts, you end up discovering that this infrastructure to be useful needs to be secure, scalable, and decentralized at the same time. And we think our technology can do so, and these are the statistics and the performances. So Algorand is, is scalable up to billions of users, is efficient because it can accomplish thousands of transactions per second, and we are going to scale up at 10x. It's very fast, 
uh, fees are very, very low, but and are predictable, which is very, very good for business. Because if you know the user base, if you know how many transactions they are, they are going to issue, you can make a calculation and build your business model, which is not true for other blockchain in which you have to guess how much you will pay. And good luck to you if you end up getting the right answer. It's secure, it's carbon negative. We don't need huge hardware to participate in the validation. We do not need to delegate the stake or bind the stake. And that's why we think this can be the answer to the problem. So how it works? Trying to resume the working principle here through an example. So imagine that each algo that you own is like a magical dice with some properties that are enforced by the verifiable random function, which is the foundational cryptographical primitive behind the algorithm consensus. So those dice are perfectly balanced and equipropable, so nobody could tamper with the result. So you cannot make the six phase more probable than the two phase, for example. If you keep observing the dice rolls, by no means you can increase the chance of guessing other results. So the observation of this randomness is very, very unpredictable. And each dice is uniquely signed. This means that uh, Every dice, by, for each dice, you can, you can name the owner. So you can know who rolled that dice. And those dice are publicly verifiable. This means that once the dice have been rolled, everybody can verify instantaneously the result, who rolled the dice, and be sure that the result is safe. How we use this technique to elect people. So for each algo that you can assimilate to a tamper-proof dice, participating in this cryptographical dice roll means that each participant rolled the dice for each new block in a distributed parallel and secret way. And the one who ends up winning the, the rolling of the dice is the one who can speak on the network. We use this technique in this way for each block and each round. So we first use this dice roll to elect a proposer, and then we elect a committee that verifies what the proposer said. And if we come to an agreement, we generate another block. So we elect the block proposer, we verify the information, and we put another step forward in the ledger. So the pure proof of stake is secure because an adversary doesn't know which user you should corrupt. You should corrupt. And once he realizes which user are selected, it's too late to benefit from attacking them. And since these happen in the privacy of your hardware, uh, those set of rules are distributed and never exposed to the network until you speak to everybody. So this machine produced an output over the years, and this is somehow a result of the output that this machine is producing. So. We produce over 20 million blocks with zero downtime. So those low are working. It's not something that is just theory. Our ledger is now almost a terabyte, over 23 million addresses, and the average of block production is 4.4 seconds, which is an impressive average because it's for 
20 million blocks with a very, very few statistical deviation of, from that number. And what we have on this machine, what we have on this layer one, we have some very powerful primitives like Algorand standard asset, atomic transfer, the Algorand virtual machine, and the Algorand state proof. And everything happens at layer one. So what does it mean is that each complex system is characterized by a natural pulsation. So for example, the electrical networks uh, have a frequency or an automated assembly line have a tack time of production. We humans also are complex system and our natural pulsation is our heartbeat. Okay, so the block time is the algorithm heartbeat. And the execution of all those primitives like standard asset, atomic transfer, EVM, that does not slow down the world blocks production. So this means that our layer one can handle all this. And the question is that, is that sustainable? So permissionless doesn't mean being responsibility-less. So although everyone can join, we have a responsibility over our planet. First of all, if we compare ourselves against the proof of work, it's very easy because it's a matter of order of magnitude. So if you take the average energy per transaction consumption of other blockchains and compare us if we're the height of buildings, so Bitcoin will be twice the Burj Khalifa while Ethereum will be the Tor Eiffel, while Algorand will be the thickness of a paper sheet. Okay, so you like to win easy because you are comparing uh, yourself with another kind of technology. So what about the other proof of stake? And the answer is that when the going got tough, the tough get going. So the proof of stake against the pure proof of stake needs to be clarified in this framework, which is the blockchain sustainability must consider the fact that you need scalable end user transaction, finality, multiple nodes in a secure network that is really decentralized. So if you end up putting that power, if you recall the first example into a machine, you will obtain an output. So being sustainable while centralized, insecure, or not scalable is a worthless claim. So I would like to reframe the question, the first question, is the algorithm blockchain efficient at consuming energy to finalize and use our useful transaction in a secure, scalable, and decentralized way? This is the real question. This is the, all that matters. And so Algorand transaction are 100% available to end users. Other proof of stake consume their own transaction for consensus, for example. There are some of them. So when we say finalized transaction, we mean really useful transaction. Algorand transactions are under percent instantly final. So other proof of stake must consume the energy of several blocks to ensure transaction finality. And Algorand transactions are secured by a very decentralized network, some other proof of stake blockchain have only few validators. And Algorand security is a feature of its own efficiency. Algorand never experienced a downtime since the Genesis block. So the answer is yes, 
Algorand is the most efficient blockchain.